All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to my home office. If you're watching the recorded version of this, uh, I'm really excited that we still get to gather together this morning, even if it's uh, just in our homes with our families or in small groups. Uh, before I get started with today's talk, it really felt strongly that I needed to start off this way. We are living in very, very strange days. Um, I've heard people of every age say this is something unlike anything we've ever seen, unlike anything we've ever lived through. So I just want to encourage you at this time, if you are feeling anxious uh, or worried, please don't feel guilty. Lots of us will be concerned about what's happening, and there are things that you can do to alleviate the anxiety, uh, and feeling guilty is definitely not one of them. So it's a, it's a very natural thing. It's a very normal thing. You know, we, we want to be a community that's pressing in for more of God. We want to be a community that uh, is bold and heroic and brave, like the God we serve. And sometimes that can cause us to uh, ignore the way that we're feeling. But I, I want to just dive into more of that today and have a little bit of an honest discussion about uh, the test of crushing and what that means for us. So welcome to week five of our Victoria series at Oxford Vineyard. For the past four weeks, we've been diving into what it means to live victorious lives in Christ, and we've been examining how we can do more to see God's vision and will for our lives fully realized. Uh, Jeremiah 29 11 is a really good reminder for us, I think, in this time. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. So let me just pause on that for a moment. God has a vision and a plan for your life, and it's one that's so good you can hardly imagine it, and it's one that you don't have to earn. Um, we are pressing on with this series because we have lots of life left to live, uh, and we want to live it in fullness. We can't afford to be short-sighted. We can't afford to only be worried about what's right here in front of us for the next two or four or eight weeks or whatever. We have to be people who are looking out into the future, looking decades into the future, living for the next generation. Um, we have a mission that we've been put here to accomplish and we have to stay focused on accomplishing that. And if that means uh, things look a little different for a few weeks, then that means things look a little different for a few weeks. So a while back, uh, I discussed with you the reality of the inhale and exhale of life in ministry. Uh, the fact that all of us, regardless of who we are or where we're coming from, we need to exhale. So we need to work and we need to give away what we've been given and we need to inhale. We need to take uh, time for rest. We need to meet with God in silence and solitude and encounter him through worship and spiritual disciplines. So I just want to refer you back to our message from January 26th. Uh, I think it's something that is really for this time when a lot of us are off work or we're out of school and we're stuck in our homes, we feel cooped up and we feel frustrated. Um, this is the time to press in and see what God has to say to us as uh, a people. Bree pointed out to me earlier this week how interesting it is that not only here at Oxford Vineyard, but in numerous other local churches and house churches all over the place, this topic really came to the surface around the beginning of this year. And I think it was such an appropriate time to land there. So now here we are social distancing uh, and coming face to face with our emotions that we're usually able to suppress because we're so busy and we have other things to worry about. So if you feel frustration, if you feel uh, this stir craziness, you know, or anxiety or worry rising up inside of you, um, I would refer you back to some of those practices. You know, don't don't stuff it down um, because that's your body, that's your spirit trying to tell you something um, about yourself. So seek God about that thing. So we've been talking for the last four weeks about the tests of Christ, the important landmark moments in the life of Jesus when he overcame challenges and emerged successful in the face of tests and trials to clear the way for us to live victorious lives like he did. We've already discussed the tests of identity, authority, betrayal, and obedience. And I'm not going to spend any time rehashing those things because those messages were excellent. You can go back and listen to them. Um, I would encourage you to, to do so, to check those out on the website. But this week, we're going to be talking about 
uh, the test of coronavirus. No, I'm kidding. We're going to be talking about the test of crushing. So Jesus throughout his life was crushed. He was crushed by the circumstances of the world. Sometimes that meant things that were coming from people. Sometimes that meant things that were coming from the accuser. And sometimes that meant things that were um, part of the will of God for his life, just difficult circumstances that he had to overcome. So this is a heavy topic. It can be confusing, but I think it's really relevant to today, uh, to this moment. So I want to pray and we'll dive in. So Jesus, I just thank you for everything that you're doing in and through Oxford Vineyard Church. I thank you for this season where we can get creative, where we can humble ourselves, where we can set aside our programs and set aside our agendas and really just press in and ask you, God, what do you have for us in this season? How would you have us change our plans? How would you have us um, reach the people around us and advance the kingdom? How would you have us love on the people in our cities to wash the feet of our neighbors uh, in a time when so many people are scared, so many people are worried? How can we be the church, Lord? Uh, just ask that you would reveal these things to us, that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, uh, what do we mean by crushing? I, I've said a few times that we're talking about the test of crushing. And I just want to make a quick disclaimer statement right away. There are ways that Jesus was crushed that you and I will never have to deal with. Uh, you will never, never personally bear the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, um, and be offered up as an atoning sacrifice. Uh, Jesus' time... In the Garden of Gethsemane, which is this story that we're going to be looking at this week, um, was preparing him to do just that. So there are some really good parallels. There are some things that we can learn from, uh, but it's not a perfect one-to-one. -one. So without a doubt, our own stories also include elements of feeling like we're being crushed. Uh, maybe that's a circumstance with one of your kids or a spouse Maybe that's an abusive situation. Maybe that's a really intense season in your career. Maybe uh, it's a more existential pressure of trying to figure out who am I and uh, what do I believe about the world? Or maybe you've even been in intense physical danger uh, where you feared for your life or you weren't sure how your basic needs were going to be met from one day to the next. Whatever the crushing is that you've experienced, um, or that you might even be experiencing now, I want to assure you of one thing, that Jesus has already passed the test of crushing, and he has paved the way for you to also walk in victory. <coughs> so let's go ahead and dive into the story that will serve as our main source of inspiration today. It's going to come from the Gospel of Luke, Chapter 22, verses 39 to 46. And I'll give you a second to find it in your Bibles if you want to read along with me. So, it starts out, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, or Gethsemane. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So I want to pause here for a moment. Uh, we talk a lot about how Jesus is 100% the truth about man and 100% the truth about God. And right here we see what is really one of the most human moments of Jesus' life, as well as one of the most divine moments of Jesus' life. Uh, last week, Josh talked about how Jesus remained obedient in the face of this seemingly insurmountable task that he faced with godlike faithfulness. 
And this week, I want to talk about the other side of that, the, the complex and beautiful reality that as Jesus experienced one of the most divine breakthroughs of his life on earth, he was simultaneously experiencing one of the most fundamentally human things that most of us don't associate with God, and that's suffering. Jesus suffered. His human form was crushed beneath the weight of what he was experiencing. His 30-some-odd years uh, walking on the earth had come to this. His friends abandoned him. He no longer felt the presence of the Father with him. The authorities who had been seeking to frame him for years were on his heels, and the cup uh, of the cross was before him. And so there was simply no way out. The walls were closing in. And uh, I, I ask, have you ever felt this way? I know I've felt this way. Um, and yeah, this is heavy first thing in the morning, but it'll eventually get better. I felt the walls of anxiety closing in, the feeling of isolation, uh, knowing that you know you can't trust the people that you thought you could trust with your life even minutes ago. Um, often referred to as the dark night of the soul, this is a moment that Jesus too passed through. And so if you're there this morning, if you're feeling crushed beneath the weight of life, if you don't know what your next turn is, uh, I want to encourage you that Jesus has been there. When we talk about God being with us, um, to someone who may not possess that deep understanding that God too went through what you're going through as Jesus, verses like Psalm 23 might sound trite. When we say God is with us and, and he's for us and all these things. But once you know that Jesus himself passed through the dark night of the soul, he becomes a much more viable companion uh, when you're there yourself. So I want to encourage you that Jesus has been there. <coughs> now, there's a lot of symbolism in the Garden of Gethsemane. First of all, the word Gethsemane means olive press in Hebrew. Uh, the way that the olive press itself works is fascinating. To produce oil from the olive, it must be crushed under the weight of an enormous stone into a pulp. And that pulp is transferred into these enormous woven bags um, and crushed under the immense weight. Uh, the olive oil spills from the fibers of the bags into these bowls that collect the oil. So if we were together and it was Sunday morning, I would have slides with pictures of those things for you. Um, but the oil that spills out of the olive press is a brownish red color, and it, and it distinctly resembles blood. So in the garden, as Jesus sweats blood, he becomes the physical embodiment of that olive press. Now, it's a neat uh, thing, what Jesus experiences in this story, and the process of making olive oil, you know, kind of lines up with that. But why is any of that important? Um we've arrived at the critical question that we have to ask ourselves about this whole test of crushing. So when an olive is crushed, the oil comes out of it. When Jesus is crushed, what exactly is coming out of Jesus? Uh, the book of Isaiah was written some 500 years before the birth of Jesus in the 500s BCE. And Isaiah 61.1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to prisoners. So 500 years later, Jesus, at the beginning of his public ministry, stood up in the synagogue and he read aloud the following. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. When Jesus says that God anointed him, he's referring to anointing with oil, um, quite possibly olive oil, a centuries-old traditional blessing. Jesus says here, quoting the words of the prophet Isaiah, that the Holy Spirit is that anointing. It, he is that blessing 
um, when he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me uh, because he has anointed me to do these things. So what's the purpose of this blessing? To bring poor people good news, to set people free who are oppressed, to allow blind people to see, to repair our broken hearts, and to proclaim debts forgiven. When Jesus is crushed, what flows out of him is gentleness, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, justice, and mercy that is the kingdom of God. And as the story of Jesus' trial and his crucifixion continues in the Gospel of Luke, we see that crushing indeed produced that oil of the Holy Spirit. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, one of his disciples cut off the ear of one of the soldiers, and Jesus renounced his disciples' violent outburst, simply saying, stop, no more of this. He reached out his hand, and he healed his accuser, one who would go on to assist in facilitating Jesus' painful death. And Jesus, as he's crucified, speaks out these words that cut to the depths of my soul every time I read them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The criminal being crucified beside Jesus comes to understand who Jesus is. And Jesus replies to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is what's coming out of Jesus as he's being crushed. Jesus breathes his last, having spent the final hours of his life lavishing gentleness on his accusers and on those who didn't deserve his gentleness. Now, of course, we know the rest of the story that Jesus is resurrected three days later. And as we see in the Gospel of Matthew, he commissions Mary Magdalene, yes, a woman, to be the first one to preach the gospel as we know it today to Jesus' own disciples. And the same Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus to do these works fills the believers in Acts 2 and all who subsequently believe in Jesus in the millennia to come. Uh, the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus to emerge victorious in the test of crushing dwells in us today. The same Holy Spirit who released gentleness as Jesus was being crushed is the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of us today. So that kind of forced me to ask myself, when I'm being crushed, um, what comes out? And I want to level with you. Uh, I had a hard time writing this talk this week. I had a hard time because of everything that was going on around me. I was thinking about finances and I was thinking about the future. Uh, I worried about the plans that I have made and I worried about the plans that I hoped to make and I worried about plans that I would probably have to cancel. I thought a lot about the fact that uh, if anyone has asked me how I'm doing in the past four weeks or so, my response generally has been, I'm doing well. Uh, there are a lot of exciting things that I'm looking forward to. And I got really disenchanted with just everything when this malaise of COVID-19 uh, sort of settled over my life. There were a lot of considerations to make. What do we do with church service? Uh, what about Sockham? Is canceling church being cowardly, as some people said? This accusation that people were making, although it wasn't made about me specifically, um, all over social media, it pierced my self-awareness uh, as I read it time and time again. And I know these folks didn't have the intent of uh, tearing down their pastor's confidence in their ability to lead, but that's the effect that it had on me. Uh, it made me nervous. I, I didn't think that I was cowardly, and I certainly didn't think that I was shrinking away from my kingdom assignment for having a desire to abide by the request of uh, government leaders to limit the size of our groups, but was I being cowardly? Am I being cowardly? Um, I, I don't know. The truth is that we're in the middle of a global event, the circumstances of which are new to all of us. So church, I want to ask you something this morning. Uh, I want to make a request of you. I want to ask you that in this season of crushing, that you would deal gently with every person that you come across in the days to come and, and in the weeks to come. I want to encourage you to lift up, not tear down. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit how to uh, show you, to, to show you how to operate in gentleness and in kindness, in compassion, forgiveness, justice, and mercy 
for those around you the same way that Jesus does in the face of crushing. To look after people who are faint-hearted in this season. I want to be really clear. I was never afraid of COVID-19 this week. I was afraid of the angry emails that we'd receive if uh, we canceled Sunday service. I was worried that we might not be able to cast the vision for reimagining church for a few weeks. I was afraid that in an effort to uh, chase after this radical countercultural life that we want to live, and we want to live that life, we would make a reckless mistake and put the people of our city, uh, who I love dearly, in some sort of danger. But never once was I afraid of a virus. Now, I recognize that all of that was the work of the accuser in my life. I know that uh, the people we serve in this church only have our best interests in mind. But that's how fear works, isn't it? Uh, it manifests in our lives. Our anxieties aren't always true, but they feel real to us. Even so, uh, there might be some truth to some of those things uh, as I was feeling crushed by them. But we need to figure out how to respond in a new way. So I'll share with you another little detail, uh, even though it's a little embarrassing for me. The key pieces of this talk didn't come together until Friday night. Now, I'll have you know that that is not my style. Um, as a matter of fact, I like to tell people that I have a really keen ability to detect when a pastor uh, has actually taken the time to gather resources and figure out what they're supposed to say in advance and really spent time in prayer and seeking the Holy Spirit. And uh, when they're delivering what I like to call the Saturday night special. I think uh, the reason that this happened to me was because it took me that long, it took me until Friday night, to slow down and wait to hear what God was saying. I was, I was so wired all week that I was hardly able to take a second and wait to hear what he was saying to me. The lesson there for me and for you is this. If we take the time to stop and ask God what he would have us do, what Jesus, by his spirit, wants to release inside of us and through us to the people around us, we will find out that it is the same anointing that Jesus received to bring poor people good news, to set people free who are oppressed, to allow blind people to see, to repair our broken hearts, to proclaim debts forgiven. I believe that this is our assignment in this season and in every season. That's how the kingdom advances, and that's how we partner with Jesus to make disciples. So in this season of social distancing and taking time to slow down and uh, frustrating changes of plans, let's get in touch with how God wants to work those purposes through us. Maybe he wants you to reach out to your neighbor for the first time in your life. Maybe he wants you to pray for every person you see when you're out. Maybe he wants you to get alone with him for a number of days or weeks and seek his face in a way that you never have before. Maybe he wants you to learn how to worship with your family for the first time. Whatever that is, um, I want to close with this. Something that caused me to react differently to the crushing this week uh, was hearing a short encouragement from a pastor who I dearly respect, uh, Mike Pilavachi. And Mike posted a video on Thursday about Psalm 23. And uh, Psalm 23 is one that many of us have heard many, many times. And I will even confess to uh, rolling my eyes when I saw the title of Mike's video was Psalm 23. But I watched it because I love Mike. Uh, and as I heard him speak these words, the Spirit of God touched my mind and touched my heart and put these fears of mine at ease. He met me in the crushing of the season. And so I'm going to read it to you again. This is David speaking, um, and this isn't him writing when everything was fine and dandy. He wrote this at a time when he was being persecuted, when he was being pursued by people who hated him, uh, when his life was in danger, and when he had every reason to be afraid. He wrote, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we stop to realize that Jesus has already been through the valley, that he is there in the presence of your anxiety, he's there in the presence of your anger, he's there in the presence of your uncertainty, uh, that he encounters us. This is one reason that Jesus is unique among the different gods that folks worship. Uh, he had a uniquely human experience when he entered into the depths of the things that challenge us the most and won the battle for us. No other God has ever done that. This is an opportunity to get closer to him. Maybe it's an opportunity to say yes to Jesus for the first time. Maybe it's an opportunity to renew your yes to Jesus. Uh, but wherever you are, we can stop and realize that he is with us in the crushing. And in fact, he's already been there. So let me pray for you. Lord, I just thank you for the people um, who are listening to this. I thank you for Oxford Vineyard Church, for everything that you're doing among us. God, we're so excited to meet with you. We're so excited to see what you have for us in this season. Lord, would you just reveal what it looks like for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to be on us, for us to move in gentleness, move in kindness, and at the same time move in power. Not forsaking one or the other, but holding them both together exactly the way you did, Jesus. We want more of your Holy Spirit. Right now, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would fill up anybody who's listening to this uh, and empower them to do the works that Jesus did. Thank you for your presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining this week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon.